Welcome to Episode 1 of Season 2 of Brain Health Matters, a podcast dedicated to helping you connect with the people and resources that will help you improve your memory, boost your brain, and reduce the risk of developing dementia. In Season 1, we had a new episode every week, but for Season 2, at least for the first few months, we're only going to be releasing a new episode every two weeks so that I can focus on treating the many clients who are seeking help and so that I can focus on writing my newest book, The Mindful Brain. So be sure to subscribe to Brain Health Matters on YouTube or your favorite podcast service to ensure that you get all of the latest episodes as they're released because in each episode, we share important information that could change your life or the life of a loved one. This week, the mental and brain health effects of alcohol and other addictions. Is it true that we lose thousands of brain cells every time we imbibe? You'll find out in just a moment. Brain Health Matters is brought to you by Don't Let the Memories Fade. Learn many enjoyable ways to enhance body, mind, and spirit with simple lifestyle changes that will help you improve your memory and your mind. You can create a healthier, more vibrant future with Don't Let the Memories Fade. Available in ebook and paperback on Amazon everywhere. Hello there and welcome to season two of Brain Health Matters. I'm your host, Kate Kunkel, and this week I'm joined by Stephanie Pratico. She's an independently licensed mental health and alcohol and drug abuse counselor. She's also a clinical supervisor and educator who's been in the field for 12 years. Stephanie works with patients with substance abuse, addictive and mood disorders, and focuses on depressive and anxiety disorders. Stephanie believes that we can find healing through self-love and compassion, physical self-care, and joy in movement and mindfulness practices. We are so on the same page. Stephanie also advocates that maintenance of physical health is crucial for emotional wellness and a strong self-esteem. Welcome, Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Kate, for having me. It does seem like our approaches and our philosophies are very similar, so... I'm sure your listeners will enjoy hearing our conversation. I'm sure they will as well. Yes, because we're not just little bits of people, right? We're not pieces. We are holistic beings and everything depends on everything else. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact uh, that the title of your podcast aptly named Brain Health Matters, but also seeing like the brain captain of the ship, but also our heart, our emotions, our spirit, our physical body. How does it all tie together? The brain is the control center, absolutely. And I remember when I was younger, it was commonly thought that if we have one incident of overindulgence or binge drinking, we're gonna kill like millions of brain cells. Is that true? Yeah, I know we were gonna embark on that question today and just kind of look at the bigger impact of alcohol, both on the short-term and long-term side effects and, and what happens with alcohol in the brain. And to answer that question right off the bat about the the, language out there that alcohol, one night of binge drinking, you're going to kill a bunch of brain cells. I'd say that's an overly simplified kind of version and maybe a little bit of scare language, right? Uh, so binge drinking, let me, let me answer the question first about the killing brain cells piece. So killing brain cells is, is kind of a, maybe not the right way to say it. So it does impact, uh, our neurons in the way that messages are communicated in the brain. So in the short term, like that is definitely something that's happening. It impacts, uh, it brings down our inhibitions and we know that that can lead to some consequences. And some people love the slowing effect that it has on our brain in terms of we can feel more at ease, more relaxed and things like that. But, uh, and, and part of that is on the neurotransmitter level, but in terms of killing brain cells, uh, that that's a little bit of a hard way to put it. Now that said, like long-term consequences, yes, there's definitely been studies that have shown in the way that atrophy shows in the brain after long periods of chronic drinking or even moderate drinking. Um, but the, the one-time overindulgence, uh, that, that, can be, that can be a hard way to say it. Now that said, I'm not saying go out and do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are listening to this who are very relieved that it doesn't mean that you've killed a gazillion brain cells. What other things though can it do within our brains while we're engaging in drinking alcohol? It doesn't mean like over imbibing, but rather just drinking. 
Right. Yes. Yeah. So a short term, one of the things that we talk about most, like a short term brain impact and the way that it alters our chemistry is that impacts GABA functioning. And so GABA is one of our neurotransmitters and it's related to um, regulating our nervous system. And so when we get into that slurred speech, lack of coordination, that's what's going on there. So we notice that, you know, if there's one night of even just having one glass of whatever, and then like the more that we have, the more that GABA transmitter is being impacted and, and so on. I think one of the main things that I do want to say about those overindulgent nights and the binge drinking, since you asked, is, is those consequences that come from the lack of inhibition and um, the mood lability. And sometimes people can have like a manic response to, to drinking or engage in risky behavior. And, and so those consequences, uh, you know, that can come from the changes in the chemistry and our inhibitions, that, that's something that obviously can be very impactful. Sure. Yeah, you know, I never really thought about that in terms of how just changing our inhibitions or like speaking out a little bit more than we might normally speak out or that sort of thing, and it can have long-term consequences. How about some of the long-term effects on the brain though, the physical brain? Right. Yeah, so they've, they've found plenty of research has looked at the shrinkage in the brain of heavy users. And so shrinkage is another way to say atrophy. So it's parts of the brain that are not um, being utilized, so to speak. And so they've found, there was a study out of the University of Oxford that found that people drinking four or more drinks a day, which we would say is heavy use, they're six times more likely for a risk of shrinkage in the brain that they can show on scans. So six times more likely four drinks or more. Now we know, we can say that that's heavy drinking. So three, two to three drinks is three times more likely. And then even just one drink a day, they have shown that there can be some risk for atrophy in the brain. I now, do know that it does imp increase the likelihood of, or it increases a risk factor for dementia. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And that that's what the, the atrophy points to there. And then also there's a type of dementia specific to alcohol use called Korsakoff syndrome, if you've heard of that. And that also has to do with uh, nutrition deficits, def deficiencies, there we go, that can come from uh, alcohol use. But then there's also piece of cardiovascular issues that can come, uh, the impact of uh, poor sleep, chronic poor sleep from alcohol use. So, you know, it does, when we're talking mind, body, spirit, it really can impact us in, in many different ways. Another thing is the mental health aspects of it, right? Not just even for addiction, but it can be, if the brain is atrophying, that must, that has to affect some portion of mental health as well. Oh, absolutely. And I, I can tell you anecdotally and working with thousands of people at this point, the, the impact that alcohol use and the decision-making that can go around to that. And also uh, the reward pathways in the brain and how, when we're caught in this compulsive cycle of, Oh, this is something that feels good. I'm going to keep doing this over and over and over and how that can feel. Clients of mine have referred to that as feeling insane, like that. It's just like, I'm very stuck in this loop and I can't get off of it and how that can lead to feelings of hopelessness, depression, anxiety, and then never mind, like we were saying earlier, some of those other consequences that can come that create their own problems, like say in a relationship or legal issues or work issues or things like that. Well, sure. So depression and anxiety are so common especially now it seems um is that a chicken before the egg kind of thing though like what how does that work because if you're already depressed maybe you want to use the alcohol but then the alcohol yeah. can make you more depressed oh big time yeah and and i think saying it as a chicken and the egg problem is is spot on because i i've often had people ask me well, what do you think came first, my depression or my drinking? And and some can make that link. Like I've been drinking to try to self-medicate and manage my depression and anxiety. And even on a, an example like social anxiety, someone going to a bar and drinking so that they can feel more comfortable and then how that cycle can be problematic, right? Uh, so it's hard to point to the origin. Like there, there is a piece about genetic predisposition, but that's not a hard and fast thing for everyone. Like some come from 
families with a long history of alcohol use, and then they don't have any addiction issues and, and vice versa, right? So it's not that simple, but I would say that if someone is experiencing mood symptoms, then alcohol can certainly be fuel on the fire. It's not a cure. And I think sometimes people will look to it to try to feel better. And actually it's like, oh, that might be digging, digging a deeper hole. Uh, and then it takes more complex work to get out of that hole. I've understood, I understand that also like a traumatic brain injury, it can mm -hmm. affect the part of the, depending on where it was and how severe and so forth, it can also create a deficit that would lead someone to be more likely to overindulge, not just in alcohol, but in other addictions as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, again, when we're talking about traumatic brain injury and like the complexity of that, and when we were talking about lower inhibitions earlier, those with TBIs tend to have some issue with um, executive functioning and making some, some good decisions. And so that can, that can be impaired, uh, certainly. And that, that's a, I would say in terms of pouring fuel on the fire, someone with a TBI, we certainly wouldn't be recommending uh, to be drinking. <laughs> no, because you've got enough to deal with in the first place. Exactly. So exactly. one of the things that I like to talk a lot about here is, is solutions, but we need to know where there's a problem first. So, you know, people say, I don't drink bef I don't drink before lunch and I don't, you know, I might have a drink at lunch, but then I don't have anything until three o'clock or something, you know, back when I was in law school and working in the corporate world, you know, everybody had a liquid lunch. Lots of people had liquid lunches, but they never had a problem. Nobody had a problem. But what nowadays it's frowned on a little bit more, of course, but how can we tell when there's a problem? Yeah, great question. And it's one that I've faced uh, many times when, when people are explicitly asking that question, like, do you think I'm an alcoholic? And there's so much connotation around that word in our culture, right? And, and even to say, I have, I'm a problem drinker is, is a hard thing for people. And, and there are images and associations with those words, and I don't really have a problem with it. And so people trying to get an answer to that question. And I, I always look at the question, well, it's not necessarily how you're drinking, what time you're drinking, how much you're drinking, but what happens when you drink? And do you feel like you're in that compulsive routine and that you don't have control? And are you drinking to a point where there are consequences, but then you're still picking up drinks the next weekend? And uh, so rather than getting too tangled up into some of the, the pieces that classically, oh, if you're drinking in the morning, that means you're an alcoholic. I also don't personally love the term alcoholic because I think it comes with so much weight that I, with, when I'm working with people, I say, why don't we just like not even call it that? Now I know there are some that say own the label and let's call it what it is. I, I don't really fall in that frame of thinking, but regardless of what you call it to what you were saying before, like how do we find a solution? What's your plan? Um, so, so focusing more on, okay, I know there are problems that come when I drink. So what can I do about that? Which is what makes my work so interesting because addiction is so multivariable, right? Like we're talking about physical health issues. We're talking about a cognitive process that can get a little bit wonky with the, oh, maybe I can just have one more drink tonight. It won't be that big of a deal. Like that kind of thinking, the way it impacts our emotional process, the way it impacts our social lives. I, I mean, it, it just goes on and on. So there's no one, it's, it's not like a broken arm that you just right. wrap it up. Fine. <laughs> right. There are a lot of different facets to cover. Right. So so the warning signs that, that somebody might say, okay, I'm, it's time for some help though. So like you say, not, not about the time or whatever, but how it's uh, impacting their function. Is that what you're saying would be the warning sign? I'd, I'd really point to what are the consequences that are, are coming. And one of the things that can be very challenging is for the, the folk that are in the functioning alcoholic mm. territory. Because if there aren't any what we call in the addiction world, uh, rock bottoms. Like if you have something like a DUI or you lose a job or something very overt that we can say, okay, that's a consequence of my alcohol use and I need to do something about it. 
But for those that are having three to four drinks every night and maybe have some marital discord, but they don't have anything that's so disruptive that is shedding light on this is a problem and I need help fast, that can be a really hard thing to to face. And often people don't want to face that. Yeah. And the family, for the family members, it's also difficult because how do you broach it when they, when there aren't obvious physical signs? Like in my case, I'm a brain health coach and I know that alcohol use destroys the brain over time. It does. It just, it just makes a big impact um, physically. And then of course it ends up having a cognitive effect. But how do I tell someone that I care about that isn't drunk, that that never shows lack of judgment really or anything, but just drinks a lot? How would someone like me bring that up to someone or or somebody who doesn't have my background and still sees and knows that there's an issue? Like it is a real hard thing. Yeah. And I love that question. Uh, And it's a I wish I had an easy answer for you on this, but as a friend and family member, and it sounds like you've faced this, I've faced this outside of my professional life, how to have conversations with friends about their drinking. And it is such a touchy thing, especially if you're, if you're talking with someone who doesn't want to look at it at all, it's like, this is not at all a problem. And they just have a very closed door to anything on the subject. One of the realities in addiction work is the person who is drinking is the one that needs to recognize that they need to make a change. So when we talk about it clinically, we have strategies that we uh, try to guide someone to recognize the consequences and ask questions like, what would it be like if you didn't drink for 30 days? Like, what are some things that you think might change? And so the, the strategy there, motivational interviewing, it's like we t- kind of take this approach with like a positive, tell me some of the positive benefits that might come from putting down alcohol for a period of time. So that's something that we do in the clinical world. When we're talking about with friends, family, I know that that, you know, we don't want to like try to be therapists to our friends and family, but even just to say, say a friend, family member is coming to you and saying, gosh, I had a really w- rough weekend. I drank too much. I said some things I didn't want to say. And, and if they're leading with maybe I should stop drinking for a little while to, to cheerlead and support and say, that sounds like a really good idea or to just offer these little nuggets. Right. But I, I think we can see and imagine that coming on very heavy with the, you shouldn't do this. Mm -hmm. And here's all the research, why you shouldn't do this. Like that's met with resistance. Well, it is with everything. You know, I I try to get people to eat healthier, just trying to, you know, that comes with resistance. Well, I deserve to have dessert or, you know, it doesn't seem, and and I wanted to bring this up. Addiction is addiction, right? Whether it's to food, sex, alcohol, drugs, whatever. So we've got the same process going on, I believe. Absolutely. And the thing you mentioned, food, sex, exercise, some of these uh, behave, what we call behavioral addictions when they can be problematic, but same reward pathways in the brain that I briefly mentioned earlier. So those, and we could have like 10 more shows on that. (laughs) Um, Those can be pretty tricky to navigate because we have to eat, we have to move, we have to do some of these things that uh, are pleasurable and meant to be pleasurable where The total abstinence, if the goal is to put down alcohol altogether, which I know is not everyone's goal, but uh, if that, if that's on the table, like that can be more of a black and white issue to deal with, so to speak. So, but when we're talking about some of those other problem addictions, they can bring consequences too, right? I mean, we could list all of those out. So same thing, like how do we, how do we talk about the consequences and then also have conversation about, well, what would... What would it be like if those consequences got better and how would we get there? Yeah. I also want to say there's a lot to be said by living by example, leading by example. And, you know, it's hard to have any merit in the conversation if one is over, overindulging very often and then trying to say, oh, well, maybe you shouldn't drink too much, right? Yeah. So uh, practicing our own wellness, physical self-care, moderation with all of the above and uh, living well, 
I think goes a long way. And in fact, what I've found is people in my personal life will, will ask questions about some of my habits and exercise and nutrition and, and things like that, just because they see what I'm doing and um, gravitate towards that, right? That's interesting, because um, I went vegan a few years ago, um, and I lost like 40 pounds very quickly. And I have more energy now at 64 than I did at 34. Honestly, I just people say to me, how do you keep going? And I'm like, mm, I just everything works well now, I guess maybe that's why. So I can see how and, and they do ask questions. Now, a lot of people won't go that far, you know, as far as a vegan lifestyle is concerned. But they are then more interested in other things, you know, like the exercise, like you said, by by example. So that's a that's a really good point, I think, for anybody who does have a family member, you you do have to set kind of an example. And that's for any kind of addiction. I truly believe that, whether it's food or exercise or or anything else. Gambling. Oh, sure. And when we think about the potential consequences for a gambling addiction, it right. <laughs> we can we can put numbers to that. That can be very scary. Ideally. If we see someone suffering around us, ideally, they'd be coming to us and saying, hey, I need to make some changes. Can you help? What can we do? And they're opening the door. But if you see someone suffering and they're not at that place yet, to create a welcoming kind of energy for conversation, right? Which I know is not a super concrete answer. But no, but you, you have to feel, we often feel so helpless facing a friend or family member who's who's in trouble for many things you know many situations and you just have to kind of sit back and and maybe sometimes wait but just leave the door open yeah i guess that's the best way to put it so tell me if you had someone come to you and they're they're ready they're willing to make these changes they understand they need to do this what are the things that you help them with to make changes to become healthier overall. Right. So thank you for highlighting that. And it's something that I do uh, take pride in in my practice, just my focus on uh, what I referenced earlier, the mind, body, spirit approach. And I know that's not my copyright. That's that's something we hear. But I often point to, and clients of mine that have been working with me for years will smile when I say it because I point to it all the time, uh, the whole person wellness model which is not um, specific to addiction. It's something that you can hop online and different people have kind of adapted it and pulled from it. But it's looking at the different areas of our lives and uh, how do we best function in each area. And it, I think it's a great jumping off point for reflection. Like, how are we doing physically? How are we doing emotionally, even financially, socially, spiritually, vocationally, like the typical models are eight different domains, but some have 12, six, whatever. Um, the point is that it's looking at ourselves in a, in a holistic way and addressing on all fronts. So when I use that with people with addiction, I really say, let's look at the whole, the whole picture here. Yes, substance use is taking front stage here. We need to, we need to address that before we can look at how's your social scene and how are you doing at work like if that one is taking up so much energy and time and attention we need to take that one out of the equation but in terms of mood management and this this would be something i could offer for anyone listening addiction or not how do we look at the whole picture and how do we set some goals in each of those areas and just do a quick assessment how am i doing socially these days how am i doing with my nutrition and my exercise and my sleep and so when someone comes to me, I did an intake this morning and it was like a rapid fire. Okay, let's see what, what are the things that you feel need the most attention right now? And then what are some specific goals that we can set in those, in those areas? And like I said, when I'm working with someone with a substance use issue, that's, that's the first goal, you, usually. Right. So goal, I think that's, that's a good word right there, goal. What is my goal? Because if you don't know where you're going, you don't know how to get there. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I really encourage to get specific with goals and to get really tangible, concrete, baby step kind of goals. Because one of the things that can happen with counseling, of course, someone comes in and says, I want a happy life. I want to feel better. I want to feel good. And that 
awesome. But thinking of that as an umbrella goal that I think all humans have. And how do we target the pieces that, well, what are the things that are getting in the way from that I want to live well goal? And how can we get in there and, and fine tune? And so the more concrete and specific we can make those goals, especially when I'm working with someone week to week, like, what are you going to work on in the next week? And what can we talk about and measure next time? And how do we, again, take that baby step? That also gives someone a sense of accomplishment. Too. Oh, yeah, we need that. That, that. that creates a lot of good uh, neurotransmitters in our brain. <laughs> and we need, we need those, those accomplishments. So you are also a yoga instructor, and we won't talk about that yeah. about itself, but it is a piece of the puzzle that you can put together for people to help them. Yeah, that and mindfulness. Yes, and I agree that that is a that is a huge blossoming conversation that we could have too. But I firmly believe, and just to say in a very broad way, that being more awake in our moments, so being more mindful in our moments, being more in tune to what's going on within us moment to moment, like a little mini check-in, how am I doing today? And we can see how that would relate to the addiction piece, right? If you can keep asking yourself, how am I feeling today? What do I really need? How that might, those answers might prevent, oh, I just need to have a glass of wine at the end of the day, right? If we can address things moment to moment as they come up, rather than just ignoring how we're feeling throughout the whole day, right? But for, for anyone, again, addiction or not, getting a better practice with how am I feeling in self, in my thought patterns, in my emotional state? What's going on with my little automatic behaviors today? <laughs> but then also the mindfulness of what's going on around us so that we can better respond, so that we can enjoy, we can save our lives and lead to that life satisfaction that does help depression, that does help ward off addictive and problem, uh, problem cycles like that. So. I do believe that living in a more mindful, awake, I always say the first step is awareness. Like if you can be really aware of what's going on around you, I think that can really ward off some of the mood pieces we were talking about earlier and, and certainly wanting to pick up some, some kind of substance to try to heal what's going on. So that would be how I link mindfulness to a better lifestyle. And then in terms of yoga, big conversation, but Physical practice of yoga is just one facet of yoga, but any kind of physical movement and just physical self-care, I, I just think needs, needs to be happening for, for healing and what that looks like for someone. I mean, that's, that's specific to, to the individual, but to be moving and to create a positive relationship with the body. And this is our vehicle. This is, let's take care of it. Right. So, uh, which, which is one of the tenets of yoga practice. Sure. Sure. Stephanie, this has been wonderful. You are such a wealth of knowledge. Um, you. if you had somebody come to you and they were just not sure what to say or think or do about an addiction, what is one message that you think would be important for them to know? My one message would be that living better is possible. Living well is possible. So recovery is possible if we want to use that language. Getting help, getting support, untangling some of the problem patterns, all of that is possible. Because one of the things that can, that can evolve is this feeling of, I'm never going to get better. This is as good as it's going to get. And a real sense of hopelessness with that. And Again, I used the word insane earlier, like that can start to feel like a very insane process. And so my first piece would be hope. I love that. So hope for, for someone that's suffering, again, depression, anxiety, mood disorder, addiction, hope that it can get better. I genuinely believe is true for everyone. And that would be, I guess that would be the first thing I would offer for friends and family too. With friends and family, it's a little bit of a different camp because we have to kind of watch and hope and evolve for the other person, offer support in that way. But really starting with that piece of hope and latching onto, even if it's like the tiniest bit, latching onto that and trying to like build that flame or feed that flame. 
I think it's so important about so many things. You know, I was told, um, well, there was an article and then I had a discussion with a, a coach that does the same work I do. And the subject of the article was basically that, how dare you offer hope to dementia patients? Cause it's false hope. There's nothing that can be done. And it, it like, I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you just gonna take that away from people? Yeah because there is hope there there are many things that we can do the same that we can do the same things you just talked about stephanie for addictions are the things that we ask people to look at when they're trying to improve their brain health their cognition their memory it's the same process body mind spirit social uh, every every aspect of life we can we can affect that uh, in, impact that and therefore affect our process so I love that hope piece. Thank you very much. Yeah, I I just want to say that's a really heartbreaking thing to hear because I I think that's one of the most damaging things you can say or believe and feel and bring into practice because if we don't have hope that things will be positive and well on any level and and I've worked in patient psych, I've worked with people with developmental delays that we could certainly look and say, well, that's a very hopeless situation. And how to find some good, how to find some positivity and how to be looking forward with light and optimism rather than, oh, this is gonna, this is never gonna be any better. Which addiction, the nature of that beast is it can, it can really feel that way. Oh, of course it can. Of course it can. Stephanie, how can people work with you? So I want to point to uh, the agency that I've worked for for 10 years. I've worked for AdCare Hospital out of Worcester, Massachusetts. And our umbrella agency is American Addiction Centers, which is nationwide. I think one of the beautiful things that's come out of COVID is the ability to work telehealth. So uh, accessing resources, uh, you can pretty much call up anywhere nationwide and um, get plugged in with an agency and get some help. So I do want to point to AmericanAddictionCenters.org. They've got amazing resources. I also want to say that the self-help programs available now, and it's not just AA or NA, if you've heard that, Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, there's Refuge Recovery out there now. There's Smart Recovery. There are a lot of different approaches, and they're peer-supported, uh, peer peer-led. Uh, and I think those are, there's a lot of strength in that kind of approach and finding those kinds of communities. And then uh, in terms of getting in touch with me, currently my caseload is full, but I would love to be a resource and answer some questions if people would like to get in touch with me. Okay. And that is simply my email, which is my full name, Stephanie Pratico, LMHC at gmail.com. And I can help point people in, in the right direction. That's wonderful. I'll make sure those know those, uh, um websites and your email are in the show notes. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us here on the first episode of season two of Brain Health Matters. Thanks for having me, Kate. Take care. Be sure to subscribe to Brain Health Matters on YouTube or your favorite podcast service to ensure that you get all of the latest episodes as they're released. Because every time we share important information that could change your life or the life of a loved one. Brain Health Matters is brought to you by The Musical Brain, book three in the Healthy Brain series. Enjoy the fun and easy practices in this book to improve your memory, sharpen focus, and master your mind with the healing power of music. Available on Amazon everywhere.